Hey, this is the Smart Attack podcast where we don't record, we don't hit record on the podcast and then uh, problems happen. This is Nick, the EMF guy, you know, Smart Attack is about the good, the bad and the ugly sides of technology. I'm here with Hagen Thiers. Hagen, uh, thanks again for being here. The inventor and founder of WaveGuard. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you for the invitation. Thrilled to be here. Well, we started the conversation and then uh, Hagen... Uh, was very kind with me, said, Nick, you're not recording. So we we did have some pre-conversation and this conversation is really about EMF protection devices, what they do, what they don't do, and also the state of the science around these devices. So we can dive, I think, right into uh, what is your definition of EMF protection? Because we hear all sorts of claims, um, there's subtle energy devices, there's pendants, chips, so many different things that it becomes really nauseating looking at those. But as far as your understanding goes, maybe you can start with a little bit of your background, how you got into this, and then your definition of EMF protection. What does it mean to you? All right. So I'm coming from Germany and I have been diagnosed before I was 10 years old as electrosensitive. And my father, he was a mechanical engineer and also studied then at that time already to become a natural path doctor, as you would say, in the United States. And um, he was then trying, you know, all kinds of devices and techniques and, you know, kind of stickers and pen and stuff, as you were mentioning as well, to see if there would be something of help. And since we're coming from a fourth line generation of engineers in my family, he was also measuring those things and I didn't get any reliefs from my symptoms. And therefore, okay, we noticed like this isn't working and there was no bettering coming out of that. And then we noticed, okay, there is some damage happening here. There are some problems which I'm facing. I'm not alone with that. And we don't find something which is working. And then we were starting our own mission to literally experiment at trying to find a um, legitimate path of how you can protect yourself from EMFs. And since then, I have been doing around like 200 uh, speeches around the world, have been doing this now 17 years and been doing a lot of uh, research, had my own research board with PhDs of biophysics, doing studies, internationally recognized the first study ever on 5G, which has been published and um, I'm just was trying to assess some baselines. What is EMFs really doing to us? What are electromagnetic frequency and fields really causing and harm in us? And therefore also giving us a possibility to study this further as a human race to have something which we can work with um, because a real mechanism of action was kind of missing from the aspect that we didn't know how to study um, how dangerous are EMFs. And for me, the definition of uh, EMF protection is, first of all, if you're having a lower field strength, which you're exposed to. So if you're doing, for instance, you know, you're moving to the forest <laughs> and you're not having any more Wi-Fi, any more reception and so on, you can live very remotely. That is also some sort of EMF protection because you're limiting your exposure. But it can be yeah. also that you're using shielding devices to um, limit, limit and reduce the amounts of field strengths which you're exposed to from your Wi-Fi or your or neighbor's Wi-Fi while you're sleeping with a Faraday cage. And so for me, um, EMF protection is, first of all, a lowering of the electromagnetic field strength. And this is also something how the German authorities of the radiation protection um, agency is seeing that. And then there is also the aspect about the non-thermal effects and the side effect of always being exposed to radiation. And there we are having much more work to do. We just have to look do a lot more studies and they have to be really robust since um, there is still a lot of arguing about how dangerous they are and the only real strong incident I would see there for instance is for instance so far the vaulted gauge of calcium channels because there yeah. we have literally shown that okay if you're taking calcium channel blockers and you're exposed to EMF then the side effects don't anymore happen so um, this kind of clear evidence we need more to study the effects of radiation on our body yeah i agree and you're talking probably about the work of well mo multiple biophysicists one of them is dr martin paul from sure. the washington state uh washington state washington state university sorry and uh he talked about uh 26 different rat studies where calcium channel blockers seem to 
kind of offset or cancel out most of the biological effects from EMFs in, right. in some experiments. So it, it remains to be seen. And that's, uh, of course, I, I kind of repeat that all the time, but don't, don't go and run and take calcium channel blockers because if you completely block these calcium channels, you get you also get side effects. Exactly. Calcium shuttling in and out of the cell is, um, you know, is an essential mechanism in your body. And if you completely block it, you have side effects. Maybe in certain uh, situations and contexts, you can take calcium channel blockers if you, your doctor tells you so. But uh, as far as EMF protection, we we would create maybe more problems than we're fixing by taking you know by just blocking the channels and calling it a day it doesn't work like that but one point i was uh make i wanted to make is also that we don't fully know the extent of the damage we have a recent paper by uh, henry lie and uh, blake levitt that talks about the cellular mechanisms of harms from man-made emfs we're talking about the cell phones and wi-fi and bluetooth and even household electricity because all of these frequencies are usually uh, pulsed and have certain characteristics that can um make them appear as a stress to the our biology and also the biology of all anything uh, that is living and uh, what they found is multiple different avenues of harm or mechanisms that could explain why emfs are, are a stressor one of them is through calcium channels but there are other effects and this paper is quite uh it's quite dense for for my uh pay grade but uh, of course people that are more versed into the the biological pathways will appreciate reading it but the point is that we don't fully know how emfs harm us so therefore when i see claims that oh my device protects you 100 percent against biological effects i to me it's a red flag because how can you claim that if we don't even know the full extent of the damage right some some things that they can prove if for example well brain waves are calmer when in the presence of a cell phone right yeah. the, these kind of things that are very specific and then i would be okay with them claiming uh, a reduction of biological effects, but it doesn't sell as much. Sometimes they want to say, no, it's EMF protection. And they can use, they're going to use that second definition and not the first one, not physical blocking, but a reduction of biological effects. But sometimes I see, well, oftentimes I see an exaggeration or kind of deformation of that term and, uh, and it sells very well that the, the reality is this industry is exploding in emf protection both the physical products but also the subtle energy devices and all sorts of claims appear and that this is this is what i wanted to explore with you because you're well versed into the science we had multiple conversations at this point uh in person in london and then um a long conversation also a few weeks ago and to me it's clear that you understand the science that's being done and the fact that most, if not all, companies online uh, sometimes they're on shaky ground. The kind of the science that they present, I would say most. Um, where do you want to start? I know that uh, something I mentioned is you know the the random Amazon products, uh, chips, pendants on Amazon. Don't even go there. If you're a consumer listening to this, you can even stop listening right now. I'm gonna I'm gonna save you hundreds of dollars. Don't even type EMF protection on Amazon. And that's nothing particular about Amazon or, or eBay could be the same thing. You find products with inventors that are nameless and websites that don't exist and studies that don't exist. So literally, I would consider almost all these products fraudulent. And it's crazy that they're sold. And you see some of them have thousands of reviews. And I'm like, my God, these companies, some of them must make millions per year in products that maybe are just a, a, a piece of plastic. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of, that's a shame. Yeah, that is, it is. And especially when people then literally also still get the sense of security that they think they are now protected, yeah. which can actually make it worse because you're starting to act more carelessly, let's say it in that way. And so, yes, sure. We are having those kind of products which have, zero studies and which are listed on amazon some kind of pendants and some kind of stickers which you put on your phone and uh you know just you know put a crystal inside of your pocket and now you're protected kind of stuff right and then you have uh the next level up which is saying that they are having studies and 
mostly what we can see is that that is maybe not a real study. And so therefore, maybe the question to you, what do you consider is a study, Nick? Yeah, well, that's a good question. You have all sorts of different uh, levels of of studies uh, or different types of studies, right? You have animal studies you can do. uh, But even when I look at uh, sizable animal studies that are credible, one of them was the NTP study it costs $30 million. So I I don't know what what pendant or chip manufacturer has that kind of money, but this is not spare change. Even $1 million is quite a lot of money to put in R&D. My company, NNG Media, does not have $1 million to do a study on a product, for example, that I would suspect can work and I would want to help them. I cannot, I mean, I, I, I spent a few thousand dollars in donations to try to support nonprofits, but we're talking about large numbers, uh, uh, yeah. uh, quite uh, huge amounts of money. Uh, I know that some scientists I follow, for example, and I've had a, a bit of a, a moment behind the scenes in the last months working with a few scientists that are trying to bring more truth or, or more, um, let's say, third-party testing to some of these devices that show promise. And they're so strapped for money if if we get fifty thousand dollars for such a product, it would mean a lot to them. So you can do a lot with little, but if you want very large studies, the way I see it is, it's expensive and it takes a lot. You gotta hire the right people, and it, it's kind of a long and tedious process. What do I consider a study? Well, at least if you do need a certain, um, let's say, if it's a product that is tested on human participants. The the hard thing I, I see is, well, they're going to call it a study if there are six participants. Yes, it can be, you know, it, it can be a study, but in and itself, it's insufficient to, sh- to prove something. You would need to start with a pilot study like this and then follow up. But I see a few companies that have started with, you know, five to 20 participants, and then they say, well, now it's proven. And, and yeah. when I ask scientists, what do you think about that? They say, well, you know, the study is just, it's its underpowered, so we cannot really conclude anything. We don't have statistical significance. In other words, there's not enough participants to rule out the fact that the results were out of luck, right? Yeah. Out of randomness. So maybe we need a few hundred, but this is w- where I see companies Maybe they don't want to do the science. Maybe they don't have the financing. But I see the claims that they make on their website where they say, look, we have this study, 20 participants or five participants, and therefore we can apply this to the entire human population. It works. So yeah. this is this is where the communication of, sci- of science, I think, is poorly done. So what I consider a study is anything that would show promise of... Uh, benefits or EMF protection in the sense of a reduction in biological effects. But in many situations, it's a small scale study that is kind of a, a step in the good direct in, in the right direction, but is not should not be the end of the road. But I see for many companies that they've stopped doing the science at this point. So yeah, that, that would be my definition. <laughs> okay. Well, I think it's really important if we're looking into studies a little bit deeper, there's a few aspects. And the first of that is the controlled environment. And that's why it is so important to have a high quality institution to do it. You're gonna, you're gonna see, and I have done, I have almost invested a million into research of EMFs and products and things like that. And I have worked, you know, like even with a National Institute of Reproductive Medicine as the United States and done studies with them and so on. And there were some, and what you see is everything is rigorously controlled. You're gonna see that those people, they are checking up with the participants. What did they eat? How did you sleep? How did, mm-hmm. did you have an extra coffee today or not? They are trying to establish an extremely safe environment of to look at, we are just wanting to have a very stable surrounding. And then yeah. now we are changing something and now we study the effects. 
So we want to outrule as many possible factors which can change the human physique when we're studying something. And the more better something like this is done, the stronger is the study becoming. And then you will also get um, the publication. And there you also have to pass the peer review. And this is then what is separating yourself from a study, from a pilot study. If you're not just doing something small, like telling, okay, we're going to ask a hundred of your listeners to strap an hour ring. And now those hundred persons, they're going to turn off the Wi-Fi at night. So now we are looking with our ring, what does it have as an effect? And this would be what's considered a pilot study. Yep. But the thing is, we have then still to assess, okay, how much caffeine did they consume? You know, what uh, did they maybe then start to sleep all with the light for those people who didn't have any more uh, the Wi-Fi on? You need to outrule what is going on. You need to have a very stable yep. establishment. And then also the placebo effect is one of the biggest things in any study that you need to look at. Are the persons believers of that is now something which is going to benefit me? And so this is how you're going about to start doing a study. And unfortunately, and I'm speaking here a little bit against the only industry which I'm in, but even those small institutions, and I've seen that myself, they are faking your reports. I'm not even speaking yet of a, that this is a study because I, what I see in our industry is mostly that there is not a study. There is a report or there is a pilot study or something like that. But we're like far gone from a real study, which is published, which is done with a recognizable institution and where there is an uncontrolled environment. This is usually what's missing. And so therefore, this is something which people have to be cautious about that they understand, okay, this is not a study, this is a report and we need some robust science about this. And what I found out is that if you're going to a company and this is what was setting us apart, I have, I have my own um, doctor of uh, PhD of biophysics with me and we were speaking with the oldest and biggest research institutions of Europe. And when they asked me, how is your device working? We can tell them it's based on this physical principle. And this is what is giving them also the the belief to say, okay, now we have a reason to study this, you know, but you need to have also a, first a pathway or physical principle, which is telling, okay, this is actually what is going to happen. You know, this is what we're doing. We are lowering measurable the field strength, and now we can measure the effects on that. And that's when you start to speak with some good institutions, when you can show them something like that. But the problem is that small institutions, which is the ones which you have to pass through to get to a renowned and big institution like I have done studies with, like I mentioned, then you got to go through the small ones and they fake your studies or reports or pilot studies, whatever you want to name them or brand them with or label them with. They are influencing results. And I've seen that myself. And it's just shocking because you're paying them to do research for a product of yours. And then they're slightly affecting that there is a positive outcome. And that's why you have a study to show. They say, okay, here's something which is happening. And therefore, you're selling more of your product. And therefore, you're able to afford more research. And those people, they're usually small institutions with one, two employees. And they just need to pay their own, their own house, which they have their lab inside or something like that. For them, it's also a way of living. And there is this really commingling and this kind of, you know, this kind of um, handshake uh, business happening that this kind of EMF protection companies, they get studies from very small institutions, which are testing them some good results. And then you go there and make more. And this is how they stay alive. And this is something which is usually not legit. And that's why it's, for instance, for your listeners, already a very good part to look if you're looking at some kind of study or report of any company, look about the size of the entity which has done the study. So when we are looking at WaveGuard, we have done a study with TÜV, which is like 110,000 employees. We have like done with a National Institute of Reproductive Medicine, which is part of the Cleveland Clinic with 60,000 employees in the United States. We have done with Fraunhofer, which has like 50,000 employees, I believe. And so, and those kind of institutions, they have a huge reputation to build and to protect, and they are not going to give you a favor by, by 
changing some study results. They want to be very, very careful to testify you some good results. And so unfortunately, we see in this industry that there is small institutes which are also faking studies uh, into the benefit of a company. And yeah, this is this is shocking. And well, I guess the the this is a they have a strong bias towards giving clients good results. Uh, so even if so, there's there's fraud that is one level of involvement in kind of manipulating results. But just the bias could in itself be problematic because their survival depends on clients being happy. And if they're very small, underfunded, they want to give clients kind of what the client is asking for. But that's science on demand, that's science to be purchased. And it just doesn't work uh, to be completely independent. And that's for it's sure, that's a big problem. It's yeah. selling certificates, uh, basically. Yeah, exactly. My God. Uh, so when it comes to larger studies, and this is not, uh, I, I'm not doing an, an official waveguard endorsement uh, or anything like that. And uh, but at the same time, I found that talking to you, I haven't been able to connect with an inventor that was making claims that actually, that actually, you know, done the work like you did which is with which tells you something uh there's probably at this point a hundred different companies that have contacted me uh claiming their products is the absolute best and and the thing is so i'm trying to do this work as a citizen journalist i've been at it since uh, 2016 started writing my book so it's been seven more, more than seven years at this point and people ask me, okay, well, what what is the difference between this product and that product, right? That is a subtle energy device and a pendant. And I have no idea. And then I get anecdotal reports from electrosensitives that say, oh, you know what? This product in particular, it's a pendant or it's a chip or it's a pyramid. It makes me feel so good. Okay, well, you know, that's good, but we cannot rule out placebo we don't know if it will help the next person and we don't even know if that's a real reduction in biological effects or a reduction in symptoms yeah. right so we don't so so it's not rigorous enough for me to say well guys this is the ultimate device and then when i see the the enormity around the claims these companies most of them are falling into something that is quite simplistic saying you know this thing will protect you and they put it into words that i think in the end are very um misleading to consumers mm -hmm. and this really what frustrated me so in 2017 I was about to endorse one particular company that does chip that has been endorsed by a doctor that, uh, and, and, and I decided against it. I just didn't feel good. And I said, you know what? The, the, the evidence is not strong enough. And, um, I, I want to talk about an, another aspect of this, um, which is a lot of people in building biology or electrical engineers that are aware of EMF dangers. So that's a very small sliver of electrical engineers. A lot of them tell me, you know what? All devices are bullshit. All these EMF protection devices, they're all BS. They're all fraudulent. And I, I cannot agree with that because you have certain things that seem to alleviate electrosensitivity and we cannot rule out placebo uh, some of it is quite anecdotal in the sense that there's a uh, maybe thousands of of uh, people that did uh review oh i feel better i feel better i feel better okay that there seems to be some mechanisms at play for some devices and i've also heard about scientific validation in in labs like at SciTech labs in california that do subtle energy testing from some devices. But what Dr. Gaetan Chevalier, the, the head of the lab, told me last year and really shocked me, he said, the vast majority of devices we test seem to do nothing. <laughs> and they tested a lot of them. And these manufacturers are quite unhappy 
if they give the results that are negative and one of them even uh, <laughs> kind of threatened not to pay for the study that was already done because the results were negative. Your device doesn't seem to do anything. We haven't found any benefit on, uh, you know, the, the changes in biofield, in skin, um, skin uh, galvanic skin response, uh, uh, blood pressure, all of these things. We haven't found anything. It doesn't mean it doesn't work, but what we are testing for doesn't change. Yeah. So all that to say that I don't agree with my colleagues that that say that everything is fraudulent. I think this is quite simplistic. And I think that some technologies show promise. WaveGuard is one of them. I can mention biogeometry because I think there's some there there is credibility to it. And uh I don't necessarily think it's complete protection either. I think maybe different technologies um will uh, tackle certain aspects of EMF damage, like biogeometry is more like the subtle energy aspect to it. Uh, and some of the physics here are, are kind of emergent physics. Is it through scalar waves and whatnot? And it's uh, you can you can barely have a discussion ar around this because even the physics are not established or are not you know widely accepted. So it's uh, it's difficult to talk about those. I want to dive into WaveGuard in particular. I keep hearing about WaveGuard. Um, some of my colleagues think the products do nothing, right? But I, most of them that say that, I think they're still under just this, you know, kind of dismissive at attitude towards any product that claims EMF protection or reduction in biological effects. And that's okay. But I think at the same time, uh, we should always, I always want to stay in a, in a position that is open for companies that actually try to do the right thing and, and go deeper in the science. Uh, how, I guess we're going to start with the basics. What have you developed with WaveGuard and how does it work? What does it do? Okay. So um, like I said before, we started with a path that we were looking for something which is uh, helping me. And um, as my as I was, you know, being harmed by this. And therefore, our journey was starting in around 2006 or something like that of me and my father. And we were going to different inventors and uh, to universities and to different researchers and in the end, we started, you know, we started all kinds of prototypes. We were working with all kinds of things. And then in the end, we looked into liquids and letting um, special liquids. And this were also, for instance, healing waters, which we were looking at and um, and such things. And we were looking, can you actually do some kind of um, kind of kind of some kind of protection with that. Can you do some bettering with that? And we had a, a group of electrosensitive people in Germany, which we were giving the devices to. And when we changed then, and we were going for um, giving them some devices, which used already this key liquid, which we are using today, then the people, they didn't want to anymore give us the devices back. And they didn't want to give after the testing period. They didn't want to turn it back to us. And we were like, you know, we need to study this further. This is a prototype. And they wanted to buy it. And I said, no, not possible. But you knew at this point that you were on to something. And I left home then. I was then in the nature for some years. But when I came back, I was looking further into this. And I studied this uh, much more since I was aware, okay, how important this EMF protection is. And then we were looking, okay, what is this doing? And we found out that there is the science from uh, Professor Panagopoulos, which you are familiar with, which is called mm -hmm. polarization. So if you're letting liquids interact or passing through radio frequencies through liquids, then they are being uh, changed, that they are being altered. Mm -hmm. And he found out, okay, you have there uh, a variety of changes in that property if that is happening. Mm -hmm. And one of them is that there is not any more stress responses and negative health responses, um, for instance, to rice and mice and rats. And so we were then going to multiple technical institutions and I was then finding out, okay, the devices are decreasing the field strength. So basically you're taking like a field, tri-field meter, but this just in a professional setup because a tri-field meter is always a bit 
a shaky kind of analysis device. It's the best what an amateur reader can use. But if you are going to a professional, you're going to establish again a safe surrounding, something which is good for measuring. And so what we were having there is like a shielded room that you don't anymore have any kind of waves inside of the room, all of them, which the meter is reading, but you're having a baseline established that you're saying, okay, now I'm producing in this room only a 1800 megahertz field strength. So basically like a mobile phone reception, or you're saying, okay, now I'm only producing a 2400 megahertz frequency, which would be a Wi-Fi frequency. And so we were producing this field strength, and then you would put the device inside of the room, and then we would see that the field strength, which is received at the other side of the room is dropping, which is lowered. So this is our first basic principle that we can say, okay, you put a waveguard device in your room and the field strength is dropping. Okay. And this is what the report is already terminating, as um, uh, describing with the word, okay, depolarizing. And so this is already where it started for us. We have this kind of proof that we say, okay, our field strength drops when you're putting a device inside of your room. And this is what is for most government agency considered radiation protection. That doesn't mean we're protecting from everything. That doesn't mean we are like, we have to found the Holy Grail or something like this, but at least it shows it's legit. It's there, you put it there and it lowers your exposure. So that's a good thing. Hey, let me interrupt this podcast for just a second. I want to tell you about one of the EMF protection or health supporting tools I really believe in and which also helped me finance the costs associated with creating this show. In the last several years, I said no to the vast majorities of companies who asked me to endorse their so-called EMF blocking products. And there's a lot of products out there, including EMF blocking clay cases, platforms, clothing, you name it, that are very poorly designed and could in fact expose you to more EMFs when you use them. So essentially doing more harm than good. So which I don't want for any of my readers and followers. Shield Your Body is a company that is one of their rare exceptions and that does things the right way. The company has been created by R. Blank, who is the son of the famous EMF scientist, Dr. Martin Blank from Columbia University. And R. is an expert at what he does and is also a true honest EMF educator that is completely aligned with my recommendations and values. So yes, it's true that reducing your time of use from your phone and other devices and creating distance from them, like using speakerphone on the phone, for example, will always remain your first line of defense against EMF effects. But the reality is that certain products that are properly designed can help you reduce your exposure and your risks associated with this technology even further. So Shield Your Body designs the only solutions I'm currently endorsing to help you carry your cell phone more safely. So those so-called phone cases. And to learn more, visit shieldyourbody.com and enter the coupon EMF guy to get 15% off your entire order. That's shieldyourbody.com with the coupon code EMF guy. Back to the podcast. And then when we have established that with all of our devices on different frequencies going from 5G to Wi-Fi to mobile phone reception of the different frequency bands of Europe and America and that on all devices and different areas which we have measured, then we were like, okay, we have this setup. We know we are reducing radiation, something with depending on the frequency, around 30% average is uh, what you can say is happening when you're putting a device inside of your room. And so then we see, okay, now let's look at the biological effect. Since we know if we are depolarizing, then the biological side effects should be less. And this is when I have said, okay, and this is what we had our beginning of our talk with, now we have to establish a baseline. Now we are looking at what is it doing, what it's left to us, and when we are still using this radiation which is left inside of the room, and how hurtful is this. And there I found out, for instance, and I built there a study which was on wound healing, um, wound healing of the human body. And... We have simulated that on cells, so that is nice because, again, like in the sensor measuring of the field strengths, we don't have to have any kind of belief placebo effect stuff which can rule in there and has an effect on us. 
but we were looking at skin cells. And there we found out that when human skin cells are exposed to a 5G field, that they are very much more slowly starting to heal your wounds in your body. And this was around 400%. And then we have repeated this experiment and, exper uh, and repeated it until we saw a clear line. Okay, if you're exposed to 5G, and this is what many institutes now can replicate is, okay, and then literally the wound healing processes in our body are much more slowly. And so when you have this established, and this is what every study from another product category from any other you know companies should do is they should see okay this is the amount of damage which is happening when we are exposed to a certain kind of electromagnetic field and mm -hmm. if you don't have that clear reading you cannot study your protective effects because otherwise enough. yeah otherwise you can only say we're doing something if we're looking at I don't know, let's say oxygen or, you know, oxygen or HRV in our body. We cannot say if I put my device, I have never claimed uh, um, something about HRV, for instance, with our device. But if I would find something with, that we are enhancing the heart rate variability with our device, then there is a question, what does that have to do with EMF protection? Maybe it is <laughs> Good point. That's yeah. the thing. And this is what it's making me mad about this industry is that we're literally most companies, they're trying to prove that there is a fact of their miraculous plastic heart. And this is where it gets a little bit absurd because we're not trying to prove radiation protection. We are trying to prove that it's not a scam. And those are two different things. <laughs> so, yeah. And this is where most companies fall short that they don't take the time, the effort to go to a high quality institute and start to establish, we found EMFs are dangerous and we can repeat this and repeat this and we encourage everybody to repeat it. And you'll see if you do the same experiment, you're going to find the same result. The healing processes of our human body are taking longer when we are exposed to 5G versus no radiation. And this kind of surrounding and baseline you need to study. And this is what we have found, what we have, um, what we have repeated, and what we have then published in the Cell Biology Journal. And where we found out, okay, also with our device, this healing processes, which were taking longer, are not anymore taking so long when our device is there. But not by 100%, not by 99%, but we found it was like 85%. And this is... For me, where it's legit, you're saying what it's actually doing. And from my point of view, WaveGuard is doing an amazing job of helping the people, but I'm not nearly there where I want to be. I want to give the persons much more credibility. I want to give them much more proof. And we still have work to do be done on that one. And yeah, I don't and think that should be so hidden. The, the study... That was published in in cell biology is around uh, wound healing. I'd like to uh, include that in the show notes and any uh, all, all after the discussion we can just look at the different links and, and include them. I know that uh, some some studies have been done by small institutes, but some of them have been also in peer reviewed publications. Is that correct? Uh, we haven't done uh, gone through a peer-reviewed study since, in the end, we have taken the longest time for us to study actually the depolarizing part so that we can show that the field strength is decreased. And this is what we have spent the most research on. And otherwise, we have been always trying to also go a little bit high end and uh, go at the highest uh, points of studies. And like I said, we have invested there a lot of money, but not everything there is a success. So for instance, unfortunately, we have done the study with the National Institute of Reproductive Medicine, and they couldn't come up with enough participants due of Corona. And then the study had to be stopped. And then they made an analysis of the work, which has already been done. And they were saying, okay, your fertility, um, if we had 120 people in the study, your device would have shown that it has some protective uh, influence on the sperm fertility but it's not that easy and those kind of studies when you go to those high institutions they are pretty pricey and then you're yeah. 
like of high six figures. And so this yeah. is since how far we came with the Institute of Reproductive Medicine, we came okay. to the point that we, I think, concluded around 50 participants or 60 or something like that. And we had scheduled over 100 for the study, and then they couldn't find any more participants due to Corona. It had to be stopped, but they said, okay, we would have found a result, a statistically significant result if we had more than that kind of amount of So is that... So uh, let's say it's a it's an amelioration of fertility or let's say a lowering of the fertility disruptive effect of uh, electromagnetic fields of mobile, um, yeah. of mobile it, when you have a device in your home on you how how did that that was study that, really that, work? Is, that was looked at the um, the usage time of your phone so the um, this institute has been conducting a study in 2008 from Professor Ashok, and they have looked at um, the, um, the the interlink between how much a person is using their cell phone and um, how lower how lower the sperm fertility is. And mm -hmm. so um, this was what it was showing, and there was a clear um, clear interlink which was showing okay if you're using your cell phone more than four hours a day, then you're um, um, then your efficiency and mobility basically drops by around 80%. Mm -hmm. And it was basically the less you used your cell phone a day, the higher was your sperm fertility. And what were you studying with your devices? How, uh, how, how was it designed in the sense that they are, are your devices, can it, can they be worn on the body or is it that people we had, we are, had them use... are near the yeah, yeah we, we had them use the, um, the donors. We had them use our device um, during a um, period of time that they were carrying the device with them. And we were looking uh, looking if the persons had uh, then the increase in the sperm fertility. And we were looking okay. also at the interlink between um, the cell phone usage of that. So we were okay, carrying the carrying the device for. And do you remember it? Was it? extended periods of time is it a certain amount of hours 14, i think it was 14 days which they uh, which they were looking okay. at so the person had the the, um, the first donation and then the, um, and then they got the device that were and then after 14 days they would give basically the the second donation and this Makes was sense. this was i think the setup but it was 2020 right it was corona so it's been a while okay and in this one, so in the end, is this a study that is available on your website or since it, it kind no, of we, fell I apart? Would never, I would never claim that it is a study because it was never finished. I can only yeah. Uh, yeah. show the reports, but we are kind of conservative, but I'm happy yeah, to I know. be available yeah, on the that... website and, and, and publish that results and say it's not a study because I wouldn't want to claim that it is one, but yeah, it's the full results for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice, and and uh, I know you you've you've also had a a good relationship with with the researcher Ashok Agarwal, who was uh, uh, you know one one of the heads there at the Center of uh, Reproductive Medicine. I think it's I think he's one of the pioneers in uh, in proving the link between cell phone in the pocket and the loss of infertility. And now there there are teams from Korea, and even lately, I think it was another team from China that just keeps proving, improving, improving all over again. And I think it's going to lead. It's one of the avenues to kind of finally get this message out there that you know our devices can harm us even at non-thermal levels um so yeah really uh, really important researcher that uh, you told me he's uh, retired now but uh, see, he, he's done a tremendous job um at at the um he was at the Cleveland Clinic, right? This is part of he the was, Cleveland Clinic. Yeah, he yeah. was the he was okay. the head of the institute, and he was conducting the study, which has been read like three hundred million times and had a massive impact on the world and the view on the you know on the effects on our body. And he was also telling me the story how literally the lobby was reaching out to him and trying to not get him, trying to kind of forbid him to publish the study, which was published two thousand eight in the end. And how basically then it was never be, he was never able to con do another study on cell phone radiation and sperms because there was just mm -hmm. complete money blocks there in the way. So you hear some crazy stuff in this industry. And so we have on this one side, we have some companies which fake studies or, you know, they maybe not even know that the research institute is faking them. And then at the same time, you see so many studies which are done by the officials, by the good government, by the, by the good institute which are paid by the government don't have a you know 
research payment or some kind of goal, what the research should show. And there you see so often that there is a tremendous bad health effect, like from yeah. us, which he's told night, like 80% drop in fertility. It's, it's just insane. And, you know, and then we see immediately that there is some, you know, lobby, which is trying to act and say, okay, we don't want this published. And they are doing that usually very successful. Yeah, I heard that from multiple scientists. Uh, Professor Holly Wenson, Karolinska Institute also uh, kind of felt like uh, every time he showed results that were negative, the the research funding goes drier and drier and eventually just, you know, yeah. everything around him seems to crumble the more he shows negative effects. Usually it's the opposite in the sense that when you do find an effect, you have a study that has something shocking, the funding will pour in because there's some, but it more it, it, work, it still works like that, but for medical devices, right? <laughs> it's, it's like if true. there's a, a financial look at, interest. <laughs> look, at, um, like, look at the oil industry. The oil industry have been doing the craziest amount of studies to prove that climate change is not real. So we'll look at the tobacco industry, which has um, which has done the studies to look and to prove that uh, tobacco smoking is not in any kind of health risky and cancer causing. And this is all the normal stuff. And if there is big money involved, then you have a lobbyist and some people which are trying to protect that industry from running out of cash. And it's totally normal, you know, so there is money influence there. And the bigger the industry is, the more you will see that there is some interest group which is trying to protect their industry, uh, their industry from taking a massive hit. And yeah. uh, that might be morally not really nice, but I guess from an economy part, since we're in a very capitalistic world, I guess that's understandable. So yeah. they're trying to protect their incomes. Yeah, I, I want to go back to um, the depolar depolarization and how it works, because one of my colleagues is a big skeptic towards the devices. I'll, I'll, I'll just keep it at that. It doesn't believe. Uh, anything from your devices. I don't agree with him personally. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm more, I stand in the middle and I look at uh, what has been shown, but in, in, in the test results that you have, one of the is, is question is what if we put the device not in front of the transmitter, but to the side, right? So it yeah, does it reduce yeah. field strength Dire directly if it interferes with the antenna is his question uh, or would it be would it do the same thing if you put the device in a corner for example this is what we have done and what we have shown and so obviously if you put the device straight inside the uh, field strength is lowered quite strongly and when we're having the device not in between but somewhere else in the room then the average reduction is 30 percent this is what i was naming before this is 30 percent and um this is that so we have done multiple positions uh inside of the room at different frequencies and what we have found is that okay even if you place the device uh somewhere else inside of the room so basically you're sitting somewhere in the living room and your the device stands in the kitchen or something like that or in your bedroom and you're closer to the wi-fi exposure we have shown even in that scenario that the field strength is dropped and we can show that by around 30 percent and this is really a question where they have asked us how do we do that because that's when it starts to get really interesting but at that point we don't have to explain because we have measured that. And at this point, there is no more believing or this, the things we can show. We put the device somewhere in the room and the field strength is dropping. And that is not if you're just putting it in between the transmitter. Yeah, and for sure. I mean, if people do that at home, it's I, I wouldn't really encourage users to kind of has the device by themselves because let's say with a tri field or some other amateur meter the if you're in a city at least if the the ambient levels are very high it, it would be hard to test and actually conclude anything uh in that kind of environment which is quite chaotic uh that's just from my it, it sometimes in montreal for example i have a hard time telling if something is on or off when it comes to bluetooth because it's relatively low power and my meter could peg in the orange to red zone all the time. That's just from the towers. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, sometimes, so it's riddled, user testing, amateur testing is riddled with errors and the possibility of kind of concluding the wrong thing. So I have, I do have to mention that. Uh, as far as 
the mechanisms i'm i'm just how how can we picture the mechanisms of how it's doing what it's doing i know um some of the science is probably proprietary is it that um it's attracting fields because i saw some grounding technologies from one uh electric uh, audio engineer in particular that kind of use principles that you can literally ground the the electricity that that is uh positively charged with um with technology that that produces negative ions and other um, surfaces that have an extremely high uh, or an extremely low impedance. So it kind of grounds and attracts electricity more. The impedance would be lower, or let's say it would attract electricity to that thing rather than the human body was one of the principles that I saw. Uh, is it is it like that? Or is it that the EMFs that hit the device will retransmit something else in the environment. How can we think about how it works, if you can share any of that part? <laughs> well, the question is, um, the question is, for what is it needed? What we can see is that it's doing that. And I have, yeah. my, and I have my understanding of how it is doing that. But if you ask the physicians, uh, no, it's not the English word. It's not physicians. It's um, um, a physicist. A physicist, not a physicist. physicist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> then they will say it's impossible. How can you mm. use field strength, an electromagnetic field strength, when you're placing a device somewhere else in the room? And this answer, I can answer from my personal beliefs why we're doing this, how we're doing this, but in the end, it doesn't matter because we are doing. It. And so I think fair it's enough. Yeah. It that. Uh part of it is it I, I know that part of it you mentioned the the QI liquid inside. So part of yeah. it is in water physics also, emerging yeah. physics around water, which is something I've been following a little bit. Uh I talked with uh Dolph uh, Zentige uh last season, who uh is well versed into water science, goes to the annual uh meeting with scientists, including uh Dr. Gerald Polak uh and, yeah, and other uh, yeah. So Part of it, in my mind, I, I think part of it could be also in emerging water physics that is quite, I mean, some of it is, it leaves me in disbelief <laughs> about the water physics and what uh, water scientists are are telling about ca what can water do uh, with information and all sorts of crazy things that in the end, in, in these conferences, it's, it kind of seems like common knowledge, but to the rest of the planet kind of seems like, you know, uh, <laughs> magic. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Well, and I have been on the water conference from Pollock, I think three times it was. And um, so I know this kind of things and I've, you know, been in contact with him about this, but in the end to go a little bit back to the physics is, um, so Panagopoulos, he was using glucose water solutions and salt water solutions to study the depolarization and to, to let the radio waves pass through that. And basically that was one of the first things which, um, I came up with when I was, um, when I was really, uh, um, when I was starting this interaction with this liquids, and it was something which I worked with, uh, with people from the university of Milan in Italy. And so we were able to create a very special kind of state in the, um, in the, in the device or in the liquid, and it doesn't anymore behave like a normal liquid. So after we treated the, the liquid, or in this case, we can we have even shown that with distilled water is that you are taking the, uh, it behaves like normal liquid in the end from its physical state. And then after we have treated it, then it's changing its properties and it doesn't anymore, for instance, go out of a glass. It completely acts in a very different behavior. It has uh, very many different properties. And for instance, you can, you know, go inside with an object of this um, while it's upside down and stir it up and it will not come out anymore, the, the water. And so we have found some very interesting properties with our key liquid. And this is something which we have been very much studying. And we have, for instance, found obviously that it's now conductive, that it's now, um, that it's now changing its physical properties 
and uh, so um, I can show you some some of that footage. So okay, um, yeah, I'd, I'd love I'd love to see more personally, but I it's good to see that. But yeah, I think is it, there's just vast curiosities. Like uh, some of my colleagues thought that the the QI devices were just you know uh, were just empty like just a copper thing and i'm like well no 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 there's like a liquid inside there's you know so so how can they comment on a device if they don't even understand the basics of of it yeah uh, well, there's liquid inside and uh it's called a key liquid and um when we have uh, built it up and you can turn it before it behaves like a normal liquid after we have treated it um then we Kind of turn it upside down it doesn't anymore come out it has a different uh, current inside it has a different zeta potential inside it has a variety of different properties and this liquid we are connecting with superconducting wires to the housing of the copper ring and uh, this is then what it's giving it a little bit more reach and some more effective range it seems and so this is what we have been studying and where we have seen the results and we'll continue to do some research research on that side. But it's probably the most interesting part is that you can see that there are some big changes happening to the liquid and we are not using just a normal salt water solution or glucose water solution to depolarize the, uh, the radiation, but we are using our own liquid, which is specially basically invented for that. Okay. Um, I think... I, I don't know what else we wanted to mention. I know that we wanted to review the claims by other companies. I, I think I'll skip it for now. Uh, I Because it's uh, what I'll mention is this. For everyone listening, one of my colleagues uh, tested uh, red light therapy panels for EMFs. He used the professional meter. He's a professional himself. He knows how to take readings. So I wouldn't even uh, dare uh, call myself, uh, you know, an, an EMF engineer that can take these measurements. Not at all. I don't have the uh, the training for it. So he has the training. He took measurements. He posted them online and just said, you know, this red light panel is quite high in magnetic field compared to building biology standards. Doesn't mean it's dangerous, right? Danger. It, it, it's still within the guidelines that are accepted as safe by Health Canada or or the FCC, right? So, it, it's. But what he received is a letter from their attorney saying you will remove this video from the internet because it it scares people away from our company. So my point here is, <laughs> uh, sometimes with companies that have large budgets a lot of influencers if i go and and talk against them maybe it's going to put me in trouble but this is kind of the state of things in this in in this current climate i don't i don't think it's anything new but it's just companies with a lot of financing also have good attorneys so yeah. i don't know if i want to talk about one company in particular this time around but i'll consider it i know well, and and also you know, it's 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 crazy that I say that because it's a little bit of self censorship. But what what can we look for? Let's let's put it this way: What can we look for in a company? And you mentioned some of it, but maybe let's do a summary. When people try to analyze the science that has been or has not been done by a company that claims EMF protection, what should we be looking for? Well, let's let's look at the um, at. Maybe a guideline. What do we find? I yeah. was going through um, a variety of companies just today again to you know make sure I'm up to date. And on three companies, I found the first thing. I found dark field microscopy. Yeah, which Very is common. looking at red blood cells under a dark field microscope. And then saying, okay, this clumping effect that basically the plates are sticking to them to each other, this is not anymore happening. So, and this is when you go on multiple of the famous companies which are um, which are on the internet, which are uh, saying we do EMF protection, they're claiming. But the question is, what does that have to do with? EMF protection, if we would even consider that it would be a scientific principle for investigating that, which it's not, but let's leave that apart. 
you know, let's say it's a, a well a verified and a traditional scientific method to study things with a dark field microscopy, then we would have to look, okay, what does it mean? It means the red blood cells, they're now more apart, and that's why they have more access to oxygen. Okay, well, there's a variety of things which are reaching that. A good breath work, a good glass of water is reaching that. Maybe for all what we know, using a more softer toilet paper is reaching the same thing. You can see a change in red blood cells very easily. It's... Mm. It's the it's what we are seeing, uh, but the thing is, you're gonna have a little bit more oxygen flow inside of your body. But what is that saying to you about EMF protection? Quite nothing. Well, I, I, I guess one thing to, I, I think if I can just interject here, some scientists have advanced the idea that cell phones or or Wi-Fi in some experiments seem to cause this rule of formation kind of loss of zeta potential in red blood cells so they clump together instead of being separated through charge yes but it's it's certainly not the only um the only part that damages and your point is very valid that if if you just have a, a quick experiment but you didn't account for you know a difference in breath did the person go outside and take some deep breaths and is it sufficient to say to change the zeta potential i i don't know i know that dark field microscopy or or, or, or life blood analysis is kind of riddled with errors of interpretation also or so i heard so it's not the there best you, if you go on public mat and you're giving a dark field microscopy and i have just done that today and you look for radiation or anything in the relation of dark field microscopy and looking at radiation. You don't have one study in the whole world which has been done on that. There is not. There is not one study on this, which is saying that this is anything verified, that this is a valid method of looking at the effects of that. And it is important that we are looking at, we are trying to protect from something real and it's invisible, yes, but we can at least measure it. It's not anymore like we're looking at black magic in the Middle Ages where you had to believe it. We have measuring tools. We have yeah. certain abilities to study things. And this is what I would encourage people to do, to also use somewhat your common sense. I was... So shocked when I found out the other week that nowadays there is a company which is sending frequencies to you, which are supposed to protect you from electromagnetic fields. Like what? Am I, I'm a I'm a father. I'm a father of two kids. Would I? It's like imagining myself that I would say, okay, you don't anymore. I don't anymore need to use sunscreening for to protecting my children from the sun radiation because now they're getting a frequency sent. And it's like, I wouldn't trust this kind of things. And since we're speaking of something which is by hundreds of studies dangerous, we need to take it more seriously. And we cannot just say, I wanted to help. It's not good enough. You know, and you were saying you had a, a very long um, word uh, parts before, uh, which I didn't want to interrupt. But how do we know that this is working and that people feel better about it? Well, let's look yep. at trance. Let's look at um, hypnosis. There has been any operation except a full heart transplantation has been done under hypnosis as the only way of anesthesia. So that means the persons didn't scream out and died because of high blood pressure. You can do brain surgery. You can amputate a leg under hypnosis because your body doesn't anymore recognize the symptom of pain, mm -hmm. which is which is true, and this is validated. You can study that in Russia as part of normal medicine in the in the university, and this is validated. This is not some theory. This has been done. There has been every surgery performed under hypnosis except a full heart transplantation, the only way of anesthesia. But the leg was still gone afterwards. So just because your blood pressure doesn't skyrocket anymore or you're not, you know, freaking out or not feeling pain anymore doesn't mean you're not being hurt. And this is something which is really important to understand. And for me, this is what it seems to be doing. Some of those 
um, subtle energy devices. They are like a, something which is telling you and signaling your body to say, calm down, relax. This is not as bad, you know, like, and to relaxing you, looking into a heart rate variability, looking at having a higher amount of oxygen maybe still in your body. But it has nothing to do with actually keeping the damage of happening to your body. Because therefore, there is not even an explanation how that is supposed to be possible. I I agree. And I think it's it's at, at best unknown if such a masking effect is happening. Just like an aspirin or, or Tylenol that you're taking for your knee pain is are these subtle energy devices masking the headache you should have from talking on your phone. And that's always a question among my colleagues. Uh, some of them are, are doctors and, you know, they've seen some devices help electrosensitives. And these are doctors that treat people that are so sick that they, they kind of, they don't hold the same standards of what works, what doesn't. It's more like if someone feels better, it's good, but they're going to also coach that patient to remove all exposures for sure, because it's part of their recovery process from electrosensitivity. Dr. Neil Nathan told me that some devices he found do work or they seem to work and that's good enough for him, but he doesn't consider them EMF protection and certainly, certainly not turn you into some kind of a invinci invincible human being towards EMS, which is one kind of what is claimed in many situations. So uh, Dr. Klinghardt, for example, uh, told me years ago that is these subtle energy devices, according to him, are causing this masking effect. He agrees with you 100%. And he said the patients that are wearing them are kind of not are are not having the normal response towards EMS, which should be a, a loss of H, HRV, which should be headaches, which should be feeling stressed. Instead, they feel calm and the damage is happening under the hood and kind of um, shutting down their normal stress response towards these EMS that should be there and that we want to, in fact, min maintain. So his point was we're kind of playing with fire with some of these technologies. I cannot say this applies to all of them, but it is a fair discussion to have uh, when you're using those. And for sure, think about the behavior. I mean, if if I don't know EMS much, someone tells me, you put something on your phone and now it's safe. I'm going to start talking on the phone all the time and will not be stressed. will not think twice about this exposure. But my point lately has been, well, I don't want to be the manufacturer of this chip because what if I still get, get brain cancer, even with your chip on in 30 years from now? Who's liable? Is it Apple that created the phone or is it the chip manufacturer that assured me that I'm protected? So even on a legal standpoint, I'm like, well, I don't want to be in their shoes because it's it's a it's kind of a dangerous insurance to give to the public. We're talking about brain tumors. These are life threatening tumors in many situations. And you're telling me, no, 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 you're protected. I hope you know what you're doing. Right. This is this is kind of a almost on a human standpoint. This is a crazy thing to be playing with, uh, especially if you have never done a study on brain tumors. <laughs> well, exactly. And you don't have a large core. I mean, how can you make this determination? They it's, don't, they don't need it's, it's something it's, which it's, I can, and I can even answer you a little bit that as a industry insider. Yeah. As long and as long as you don't have done a study on it, which is showing you that it's not so you can claim it has been so. <laughs> that's that's brilliant yeah so they don't do this study to avoid uh let's say having Le having to show that it <laughs> that it doesn't work yes it is yeah. true this is yeah. uh, i have been through this path myself together you know as long as you were doing the things from your best conscience like i was believing in it I saw this customer testimonials and, you know, I thought, okay, I'm good, you know, and I was believing what I was saying. And no, I never did a study. I was believing in it. It was working for me. Then you did everything out of good faith and without a criminal energy. But as soon as you're doing a study and you're seeing like, hmm, this didn't actually do it. 
that you cannot anymore good willingly and saying like, I thought it was still working. No, you had reason to doubt. You had a study which is telling you this didn't help. And as long as you don't mm. study, you're legally very much on the safe side. And uh, most companies out there, they don't have any stuff. And they have some pilot stuff. They have some reports from some private institutions. And this comes back to where we started. What? How would I, as a consumer, if I would be again, you know, in the shoes of my dad to start this path like we did 2005 and like look at how do I see what is working, what is not. Look for a high institution which has done a real study, which has done a publication. And then look if there is a real damage which has been assessed and which has been then taken away. And leave out things like Meridian testing, like a dark field microscopy, which isn't uh, assessed to do those things, but literally looking at real science and saying, okay, this is a damage which is happening to me when I'm exposed, when I'm doing a phone call, when I'm, you know, having some kind of exposure. And now this is not anymore as strong. And if that is not there, then look for field strength reduction. It's the best what you have and always have a careful and honest and reasonable behavior with your own devices. 80% of your exposure comes from your own uh, devices to yourself. So if you don't want to invest money, start a reasonable usage of your devices put them in airplane mode, give voice messages instead of phone calls, wire back in and use an ethernet instead of a Wi-Fi. this kind of things, limit your own exposure. And it's something which I always will keep saying, even I'm using now, right now here, an ethernet cable again on my, yeah, me on too. my computer, which is allowing us to have a nice conversation and a fast speed. And I'm not having any radiation, which I'm attracting inside of my room, really. And this is the way I want it to be. And this is something which I always will endorse, even through when using my device away from device. Well, that's good. I mean, I think you're, I appreciate that because it's always something, to me, it's a, it's kind of a litmus test to assess any anyone who claims to know EMFs. And if they... If they if they say that you know oh um, all these steps like wiring in or you know hitting airplane mode at night oh it you don't need to do any of that just use my chip I I saw companies promote the idea that all of these EMF reduction steps that I've been talking about for seven years are useless. I saw companies say that right outright to consumers. No, 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 don't bother turning off Wi-Fi at night. It's tedious and we're exposed to it all the time anyway. Just use this chip on your Wi-Fi and keep it open at night. I saw companies promote that. I'm like, come on, guys. This is like what scientists are, are telling us is exactly the opposite. It's like first minimize exposure from all sources as you can in a practical manner, it's pract It's easy to turn off Wi-Fi at night. You don't need to even think about it if you put it on a timer. So why wouldn't you do it? Encouraging people to expose themselves more <laughs> to me is completely cre crazy. So that's these are examples of of crazy companies. But I think it gives this conversation gives a a good ballpark of to people of what to look for. And I hope to in the future maybe publish more blog articles analyzing certain studies analyzing what waveguard is doing and and kind of you know scru scrutinizing it's 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 okay and it's good to scrutinize and i haven't seen a lot of it done this interview i think is is part of this movement to kind of raise everyone up in their efforts to prove what devices do or don't do and that's important that we decipher this. And I think that the way you express yourself and what WaveGuard has been doing is uh, at the minimum, extremely superior to what most other companies I've connected to in the past have done. So I have to commend you for that. I'm um, excited to hear maybe in, in closing in a few minutes, where are you going with WaveGuard? 
are you developing new things that you can talk about or are you um, working on new studies, for example, that we can expect in the future? I'm currently um, working on uh, new products. This is something where my my focus is going and I'm uh, joining a new group of uh, researchers which is uh, which I'm working together with. We are bringing together some access to patterns for for me and to to use for waveguard. And um, I'm hoping that uh, next year we'll bring out uh, some really cool new things from that point, um, which are coming from this new partnership and research group together. And my aim is to give persons in the end waveguard device, which is reaching. 100% field strength reduction on demand. And this is something which I am aiming for and which is my which is kind of my goal that you can say with a waveguard device this is how much radiation I want to have in my room and that when you turn it up up to full power that then you will not have any more possibilities to use a Wi-Fi or a Bluetooth or a cell phone if you have it on demand at night for instance. And this is kind of what I'm wanting to go with and what I'm striving towards with waveguard and i think if that part is done then also kind of the credentials and the part of explaining people how it works will become a little bit less important because yeah. people will experience it yeah well for sure and uh, i guess at that point you're gonna have to just explain to people how they can avoid a fight with their neighbors if exactly. they Accidentally, exactly. uh, I, you know, put the waveguard so strong that the the, uh, the the guy on the other side is like, my Netflix is not working, yes, you, you asshole. <laughs> but it's very it's very easy. You just put a bucket in front of your front door and you say you want to use your Wi-Fi again, put in five bucks and then we'll turn <laughs> it back for an hour. <laughs> so, and, so and then you can refinance your device. So, uh, yeah, well, that's a that's a, a very bold goal. But I mean, it would if you see a reduction so much that devices don't work, it would be, you know, the first time I hear about the idea of, um, I don't know if I can call this frequency based, but let's say a technology that will imitate a Faraday cage without having to put a Faraday cage on, yes. which is to me a very surprising idea, but at the same, if it can be achieved and you seem to think that it can, I'm very excited it would be an ex an extreme breakthrough in in uh in what's possible um in and 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 also i mean this technology could also have other uses uh besides just you know blocking the signals including including protection from um you know protection for privacy and all sorts of uh, other applications that I see, I think, I mean, I think the military would want to, <laughs> to purchase your stuff, but, uh, that's, uh, that's the type of technology they may, maybe they even have, who knows? I mean, it's yeah. some, some of this oh. tech is gonna, I think 30, 50 years ahead of us, but, uh, it's fascinating. Well, th thanks so much again to, for, for taking the time. I think this is a very, you know, open-minded discussion. Um, uh, it's, I, I haven't, you know, done the discussion as you as you know and as my readers know to uh put a big uh, marketing campaign for waveguard but when we talked together i felt okay this person is legit you know what you're talking about you know the science inside and out and you've also told me things that really shocked me about what's happening behind the scenes and you're very open about it and i hope that people i know that people will get a lot of value from it because it's complicated it's complicated for consumers to look at test results and, and kind of try to decipher the science. And I think that this discussion, I will be able to send people back to this podcast and say, guys, if you want to analyze the science that's been done by a company, well, you got to listen through and maybe multiple times to kind of put yourself in in, in the right mindset. And, and then you might discover that a lot of companies that you thought had done the science are really just, you know, giving you the illusion of having done the science and what you probably want to do is stay far away from these companies. No, and always use, first of all, your, your good, um, human instinct and, you know, something about what it's supposed to do. If you're putting a sticker on your device, just think yourself, you know, like, okay, 
Would I put a sticker on my son to protect him from sunburn? You know, like, how is it going to do that? You know, like, so just try to think a little bit pragmatically about what is it actually supposed to do? And I think if we're using using that part, then we're coming quite a step closer to what we're needing to do. And don't look just for some result desperately to see, okay, this seems to be somewhat working, but trying to understand, okay, there is some real protection of EMF. And I think this is what the people really have to look for. Not just some result, but actual protection. Yes, actual protection and having realistic expectations also. You know, the if something seems too good to be true, it, it probably, probably is. is. <laughs> it probably is. If it tells you, you know, you're going to become invincible, you put this on your device, you're going to have a million dollars in crypto. I mean, you know, you know, it's it doesn't work, right? Yeah. If if someone tells you you're going to become a millionaire, if you click here, doesn't work. You're going to lose 100 pounds if you click here, doesn't work. So we're, I think it's tempting to look for something magical, especially if you are electrosensitive. And I mean, I'm laughing at this, but I, I know the reality from speaking to electrosensitives that are extremely debilitated. So they are desperate to find something that works for them. So if you do find something that works for you, that's good. But keep reducing your exposure, keep avoiding what's ailing you in the first place. Also, regardless of any device. So I think the message has been done. Hagen, uh, thanks again, it's been an honor and I hope we can have a follow-up conversation uh, down the line. That would be lovely. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. I hope that you like this discussion around EMF, harmonizers, pyramids, chips, pendants, and all of these uh, products that claim EMF protection. And as I explained multiple times during this podcast, just to be clear, my goal with this discussion is not to endorse the QI devices from WaveGuard or put them on some pedestal, but to highlight how a lot of companies who put claims of EMF protection on their products really do not hold well to scrutiny. And I encourage everyone to do their due diligence, look at the websites, look at the research, ask questions and identify the weaknesses of the research to realize in the end that many companies offer some kind of insurance uh, about what they can prove and that insurance quickly crumbles when you look at the actual things that they've done to prove that their devices indeed work. For seven years, I've educated the public and health practitioners on simple steps that they can do to minimize their everyday exposure, like turning off the Wi-Fi at night, um, safer cell phone habits, creating distance between the phone and your head, these kind of things. And in seven years, I still haven't found to this day a magic bullet that would replace all these simple behavioral changes. So that's the truth in the end. And my hope is that the EMF protection claims that we are seeing online are going to be scrutinized more and more as we move forward, which would encourage companies that actually try to do proper science and at the same time, discourage companies that use the illusion of science as a marketing tool. So it's up to you to navigate this space and figure out what kind of devices you want to try. But scientists mostly agree on that. Uh, there is essentially, I don't like the word consensus, but essentially a consensus among independent scientists that the best EMF protection is EMF reduction, avoidance of devices, choosing what you bring into your home. So keep that in mind. This is what we know works. And then all the other stuff, the EMF protection claims that pro products that claim to reduce the biological effects from EMFs, it's another story. We need to take those with a grain of salt. And these are not the primary tools that I would recommend investing in if you're looking to protect yourself from EMFs. And that's what I said from day one. And to this day, I still haven't changed my mind on that. So if you like this episode, please share it with everyone you care about. Remember that if you buy anything from my podcast sponsors, you're supporting companies 
that are industry leaders in EMF protection and health that are legit and you're also supporting my work as a 100% self-financed citizen journalist and educator. Take care and see you in the next episode of Smart Attack. Bye-bye. In case this wasn't already obvious, the information provided in this podcast is not intended to replace medical advice. We always recommend that you review this information with a functional medicine practitioner or environmental medicine doctor who is up to date with the latest information on the dangers of EMFs and the best practices around electro hypersensitivity, just to name these two things. And if you want to support my work, please consider sharing this episode with people you care about. You can also invest in my book, courses, or recommended products found at theemfguy.com. Thank you.